Hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. From the gym to the streets, Bellator fans head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. of the Bantamweight division. The Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix, it all comes to an end tonight. The final two fighters, interim champ Rafion Stotts versus a fighter who has looked absolutely unstoppable up until this point. Patchy Mix in $1 million is on the line. Welcome to the Fight Desk. I'm Amanda Guerra here alongside two-time world champ Josh Thompson. Josh, when this tournament began, we knew we were going to see some of the best Bantamweight fights in the world. You have said this is the most stacked division in MMA right now, and this fight has the chance to top all of them. Rafion Stotts going up against Patchy Mix. Talk to us about your excitement level for this fight. Well, the two of them have been so respectful throughout this whole time, but then as the week came up, they everything came to an head. They got the tension at the weigh-ins. Just all week, they passed by each each other the looks were all there but you can see they finally had a chance to go face to face the weight was made the fight is the next day and tension started to go over it was nice to see because I'm sure that both these guys are ready to bring it and solidify themselves as one of the best bantamweights in the world and win that million dollars I saw both of them backstage and they are so excited and so focused Sean Grandy big John McCarthy gonna be calling the action cage side guys an incredible night we have tonight we'll send it back down to you 
you. And Amanda, mahalo. And how appropriate is it that aloha means both hello and goodbye, the beginning and the end as we finish the Grand Prix tonight? Because a year and a half ago, John, we were saying, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a Bantamweight Grand Prix? And it has exceeded the outrageous expectations we had for it. And a final tonight, it couldn't be more perfect. No, it's fantastic. These are the two best guys in the division right now. You have the champion and Pettis sitting out there, but these guys have shined in this Bantamweight tournament, and these are the guys that deserve to be here. Can't wait to see who wins this tonight. Take a look at Rafael Stotts. Here's a guy, man. He has got everything. He's a great wrestler, good striking, but he does need to be careful of the ground game of Patchy Mix. Is he going to do that, or is he going to attack him? We don't know, but Patchy Mix knows that he's up against a guy that can out-wrestle him. He knows he's up against a guy that is fast with the stand-up and has power, but if he can get to the back, man, I'll tell you what, Patchy Mix is the real deal. He's a guy that everyone knows is dangerous on the ground. And what a plot twist with Patricio Pitbull facing Sergio Pettis, the winner tonight, next in line. For three years, Alima Lane McFarland was head of the line as flyweight world champion now. A fighter we have watched as the eliminator for years is now in a title eliminator. As she will face Kana Watanabe, presumably for the number one contender spot because 24 hours ago in this building, Liz Carmouche with a come from behind win to successfully defend that world title against Deanna Bennett. But our night begins with this man. Aaron Pico says he'll be a world champion by year's end. His win streak ended in memorable and gruesome fashion last October. The separated shoulder has been repaired. Now he's looking to separate himself from the rest the division. We now welcome tonight's first fighter, James the Alicant Gonzalez. Hollywood loves orphans, kids who live fairy tale stories of rising from foster care to greatness, but that's not real life. And it wasn't James Gonzalez's life. In and out of foster homes, the loss of a younger brother, it was not an idyllic childhood. But he found refuge in Jackie Chan movies. That was his escape, but eventually his destination as he drifted into jiu-jitsu. And in his Bellator debut, John, Cody Law came into it unbeaten, but he didn't leave that way. No, Cody Law came in with all the hype behind him, but James Gonzalez came out and said, you know what, this is the perfect fight for me to show everyone who I am. I am going to beat him. And man, he went out and beat the undefeated fighter and look impressive doing it. That's why he's in this cage tonight. You know, one of the things that I love about James Gonzalez is he's good as far as he's a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but he will strike with people, and he's going to end up having to strike with Aaron Pico in this fight. We know Pico is a great wrestler, but his power and his belief in his stand-up with his trainer, Six-Gun Gibson, this is going to end up somewhere with someone getting put down. And now, to make his way in What a unique path. You think about the legends of the sport. John Jones, Fedor, Khabib, the Spider, Connor, however you rank them, it doesn't matter. All of them began their careers in obscurity. Small crowds, no TV, bad lighting. Aaron Pico was a teenage prodigy, debut as a 20-year-old, came in Madison Square Garden. Every misstep, every thunderous knockout came with everybody watching. He's been the Truman Show of MMA, even a truly gruesome injury everybody was talking about. He's been a Truman Show of wrestling and just being a kid. It's amazing. He had separated his shoulder, just throwing a punch in this fight. Lasted the entire first round with his arm hanging, his shoulder separation, his corner tried to yank it, which was horrible. But Gibson tried to yank it back into place. It could not be done. They stopped the fight based upon him having a separated shoulder. He had to have surgery on that to get it fixed. He says it is fully repaired. We will shortly find out as we check out the tail of the tape in the opener. You know, just like you were talking about, Sean, it is the Truman Show when we talk about Aaron Pico. Still very young at 26 years of age, but now a mature fighter. 32 years of age for James Gonzalez. He is in the prime of his career right now. Tonight, the end of the road for the Bantamweight World Grand Prix, but it begins, as always, with Michael C. Williams. 
Ladies and gentlemen, aloha and welcome to Bellator Hawaii Live on Showtime. Tonight, we return once again to Blaisdell Arena here in Honolulu, Hawaii, as we get set now to introduce first and extend a special welcome to all the brave men and women serving around the world and joining us tonight on AFN, the American Forces Network. Bellator 295 now begins in the featherweight division set for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner at five foot nine weighing in 145.8 pounds his professional record 10 wins five losses from Shirley New York presenting James the Alucard Gonzalez And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 145.6 pounds, making his return to the cage. The number three ranked featherweight brings 10 professional victories, four defeats from Whittier, California. He fights out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, introducing Aaron. in charge, Jason Herzog. Before Aaron Pico was even born, somebody said, we need some rules for this and we should write them down. Someone should do that. Bellator is fought under the unified MMA rules. That based upon a 10-point must scoring system for the judges with the winner awarded 10 points and the opponents getting nine points or less. That is based on effective gra grappling and striking followed by aggressiveness and cage control. The feature bouts are three five-minute rounds. Championships, Grand Prix, and main events are five five-minute rounds. Back faster than most thought he would be, Aaron sure, Pico. James Gonzalez, right. a late Fight. opponent change. As we often discuss, sometimes those create a tougher opponent. And Aaron Pico probably has a tougher fight here with James Gonzalez. Yeah, I honestly believe he does. You know, this was one of those replacements. And I looked at when I saw it, I said, well, they didn't make it any easier on Aaron Pico. They actually made it harder. I think James Gonzalez is the better overall fighter than what he was going to face before. It definitely has a better ground game and is very dangerous in the stand-up. You can see he goes after you with the stand-up. The last time we were sitting together and you said that to me, about 10 seconds later, the guy we were talking about, Aaron Jeffrey, knocked down Austin Vinn. This is true. And you know what happens? You, sometimes when you get that person that they drop out and now you get the new opponent doesn't mean that's a good thing for you James Gonzalez has some pretty good names on his list he beat Pat Sabatini in less than a minute very tough fighter in that Longo Wideman MMA group on Long Island is starting to produce some real tough fighters oh, they get, they've got a load of great fighters you know? Ray Longo, great coach, love the way that he inspires his fighters. He has Pat Sarah teaching jiu-jitsu there. They know what they're doing. Watch for the power of Aaron Pico, though, when he goes to the body. Like that, that. is a beautiful shot. Right Those are there. two big shots and a third. James Gonzalez talking to the referee. Don't pay attention to the referee. Pay attention to Aaron Pico. He's your problem. Nice job. You see how he's torquing that? James Gonzalez torquing on that arm. That was very nicely done. A lot of people in boxing. That's illegal. MMA. Beautifully done. Short elbow by Gonzalez. And paid for it. And a response to the body. You're right. That was a clean elbow by James Gonzalez. But the one thing that we know about Aaron Pico, he has got a gas tank. He's like these are big else. shots. Yeah. Aaron Pico is not going to get tired. He continues to just put pressure on you and goes until you break. And we'll see if James Gonzalez can stop some of this attack and slow him down. Everyone tried to lump the last injury into the early career missteps when that was a fluke. Obviously, what happened last time out. Remember, he had won six in a row. He was closing in on the top of the division. He was closing in on the title fight. And right now, he's closing in on James Gonzalez. Boy, he's looking sharp right now. Really sharp. Go screen, go screen. And he's 
been very composed. When you're looking at someone, a lot of times when a guy gets someone up against the cage, they're going to look towards those big, heavy shots to the head. Beautiful elbow right there by Aaron Pico. But he's been attacking the body, knowing once the body goes, the head's going to follow. James Gonzalez has never been stopped. But he has never been in with anyone like Aaron Pico. Right back to the body attack. It's really having an effect on James Gonzalez. And this right here is part of the difference that you're seeing in, in Aaron Pico right now. He's had James Gonzalez hurt. He knows it a couple of times, but he's just continued on the path. He hasn't overextended, which he's done in the past when he was young. He just keeps doing what he knows the game plan is, and that's why he's being so effective with what is going on right now in the stand-up game. It's a natural southpaw stance for Gonzalez. He's got those legs, yep. Gonzalez very good off the ground though. That's BJJ base for Gonzalez. That's the first thing he will tell you about himself. He does not want to give his back. He's down, but he's down. Fighter smart enough. I'm gonna make the exit, but I'm gonna make yep. you pay on the exit. Stop. Hey, when you're coming in, you're leading with your head, okay? Don't do that. No hesitation regarding the injury. That was Aaron Pico back to being Aaron Pico for the first five minutes. Yeah, there's always that question. Is there doubt in your mind? You, know, you saw round. James Gonzalez actually try to torque the shoulder. By grabbing him and that. putting on the, on the elbow. You've seen all the tricks, right? You've seen the kicks, you've seen the so, blitz, right? He tested it. Aaron Pico responded. Beautiful shot to the body. Watch the elbow. Nice knee right there, followed by the elbow. Everything seems to be landing right now for Aaron Pico. All the poise of James Gonzalez. Obviously, these are not smart with shots it. that he's really experienced before. Second round, buddy, you ready? You ready? Fight! Pico says he was done with the detours. Big left hooks. Settled down as a fighter. He's also settled down camp wise. He was he was trying to go poo poo platter early in his career. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go here, now I'm gonna go here. I don't want to do this, and I want to do that. Well, a lot of that is because you see things early on, like. George St. Pierre used to jump around because you couldn't get everything everywhere. But right. now you have a camp like Jackson Wink where he's at. Like they have everything you need. So camps are a little bit different. ATT, they have everything you need. You don't have to jump around. And it's good to, to you can be in that position where you believe in your coaches. They can tell you something. You believe exactly what they're saying. They tell you something during the fight. You just respond to their voice and go right to it. 
That's where he's at now. And you can see the difference that they've made in Aaron Pico as a fighter. He won the rematch with Adam Borch. In fact, that's what he thought he was going to get here originally. Well, you know, in talking with Aaron, he wants rematches with everybody. He had, the, you know, they talked about Henry Corrales. I want that fight. They talked about Borch. I want that fight. And you know, these are guys that put a loss on his record. But he, again, he was super young, and he made basic mistakes, and those mistakes led to him losing. And it's the one thing about oh, that was just been another big body shot. Nasty. Bends you over. James Gonzalez is a savage because that would have taken me and put me on my knees. Nice shot with the left hand by James Gonzalez there. How many times in this sport will you say, well, this guy beat that guy? And you take a closer look and you watch the fight and you see the 28 year old against the 22 year old. And you know, it, it's it's funny to listen to people because they're like, well, he's, he's younger, but when you're talking about being really young, 21, 22, you make mistakes because you don't know. Gonzalez covering up. Can he get out of this position? Jason Herzog taking a close look. I think he's going to make it through it. James knows what he's doing. Aaron Pico in a good position right now. He starts to try to damage James Gonzalez. He's holding on to that glove as tight as he can. Smart move by James Gonzalez. That's what happens when you get hit yeah. by big shots. You tend to overextend trying to land something. You're, thinking you're less committed to doing the strike and you're more concerned about not being struck. Yeah. Leg kicks are an underrated part of Aaron Pico's game. Yeah. This is methodical and it is not wide eyed and it's not out of control. It's Walking him down and just calling crippling body shots like that. Fantastic work to the body. There's only so many that you can take. I'm so impressed with James Gonzalez and how he's yeah. taking those shots to the body and not let them affect him. Man, it's only going to take one more, two more, and it just cripples you. that he's done with that shoulder. He's looking good. He's popping that jab out, that hook. He's only thrown how many times to the body. That's the shoulder that went, he had surgery on. It's looking good. Really good stuff from Aaron Pico. Stop. Good. Have a seat. Have a seat. Water. Hey, you put on Big shot right there into the ribs. James James Gonzalez responds right off and very tough. And then goes to the ground. Pico gets on top, lands some good shots. James Gall survives. Everything's happened. And then comes right back to the body again. And you can see how much torque is on that. James Gonzalez has got to find some way to do something special here in the third round. I think staying on his feet here has been pretty special. <laughs> some of the shots he has taken. True. And you see, you know, a guy who is better pro for seven years. He's had 15 professional fights. He's never been stopped, and you can understand why. Oh, absolutely. He's showing his toughness. Durability in this fight. Aaron 
Pico thinking about weighing the options. Certainly doesn't engage or let him up. Wouldn't feel uncomfortable if this got back on the feet. But seeing if there's a different way to go. Uh, well, and Pico being really smart about yeah. it, look at, I have an advantage on the feet. I've been eating you up. I, I know your speed now. I know how you're trying to attack me. I can take you down at any time I want. So let me put this back where I feel really comfortable. And right now he's feeling comfortable on his feet. Now he's going to the ground. Teenage resume that is virtually unmatched. Is that a spot on that? Entering the sport with a debut fight. Got all kinds of mainstream attention. Center stage of Madison Square Garden. An uppercut, right uppercut, got through. Beautiful work on him with his hands. You know, you, you, you can go back to that. Look, and Aaron will tell you, look, I was young, and I thought I wanted to be the youngest champion ever, and I thought that I was ready, and I wasn't even close to being ready. And again, these little things, Sean, you know, as we get older, we realize there's a lot of things we don't know until we, you know, figure it out. And he had to figure it out. That's what he's done. He's 26 years old, still super young. He's got a lot of years left in his career, but he is well on his way to being the guy that everyone thought he could be. Justin Gonzalez still coming forward here in the third round. Big heavy shot over the top by Justin. Love the fact he's going after him. Justin Gonzalez is waiting for his chance on the big stage, and he's got it. He knows he's a huge underdog. He knows he's outmatched skill-wise in a lot of ways, but he's still in this. You gotta always be impressed with someone that is out there fighting and doing everything they can to try to make something happen. And that's what you're seeing out of James Gonzalez right now. So many of his fights have been short notice fights. He's won titles at the regional level on short notice fights. Well, one of the reasons he's been doing that, he's been successful, is he's always in the gym. He's always working. And, you know, you got to look at this as a business, as being a professional. You, know, you don't you do not do things just because oh, I have a fight. You've got to be in the gym, learning, getting better, keeping yourself in shape. That's what he does. Our newest, most popular sports cliche, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. his best round in the fight. Oh. He's still fighting. Yes. Right. Oh, that was a big shot he just took, too. And he's got a good chin. James Gonzalez, tough as anybody out there, man. I feel like still going after him here. So if you're not watching the fight, people are going to go online and say, oh, Aaron Peek, oh, he went the distance against a guy I don't know. Man, he must not have been great. He was dominant. You know, and you look and you go, yeah, he got to get, this is good for Aaron Peek, though. Yeah, the agree. more time that he's getting in the cage right now, at this point, this is exactly what he needs. It's good for him. James Gonzalez has been a great opponent for him. He's really, he's pushed the ball James, and a lot of guys would have quit with the body work that Aaron Peek has done. Not James Gonzalez. I'm saying, I don't know James Gonzalez. Maybe he should. Still firing back. Yep. Oh, trying for it. Love it. Went for the try and fly. Went looking for that fly triangle right there. Nice job by James Gonzalez. Like I said, going for it. Going to be just the second man to go all 15 minutes with Aaron Pico. Still moving forward at the end. Good stuff. That's a great point, John, because if Aaron Pico goes in 
and knocks Gonzalez out in 30 seconds. You haven't answered the questions that you wanted to have answered if you were in a big you know, Yeah, you, you, didn't, you didn't have the, your shoulder put in the compromising positions. Yeah, you didn't have all that back and forth pressure and push. All these things that can occur yeah, in a fight. The job done. That guy and you can take a look, take a look at Aaron Pico's face. He did. Yeah, he was in a fight. Jason Gonzalez, that was a fight. More ground and pound. Aaron Pico had won six in a row until the shoulder injury forced him to lose the fight against Jeremy Kennedy. This is the one he hopes will begin his track back towards the top of the featherweight division. He hopes to be, he expects to be a champion by the end of this year. He takes his first steps back towards that tonight. We're big fans, by the way. You're a good man. to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges, Brian Miner, Derek Cleary, Michael Bell. I'll have it exactly the same at 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Aaron. Aaron Pico gets the win. He puts in the extra work, and he's got a little more work to do. Is Aaron Pico about to join John McCarthy? No, 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 that's it. I knew that guy was tough. Aaron Pico, looks like you've been in a fight there, mister. How you feeling? I feel good. I've had better days, but people don't realize that taking a tough guy like this on a week's notice out of Sarah Longo's gym, he's not a scrub. So people, were, I was not underestimating him. I knew he was dangerous on the ground, but I only had one week to prepare for him. Thought I did good, took some unnecessary damage, but hats off to him. Thank you so much for taking the fight on a week's notice, and uh, I'm very thankful, honestly. Let's talk about your striking, because you went to it a lot. How was your shoulder with those strikes? Because you used that left hand to the body beautifully throughout the fight. It was hurting me. Yeah. Honestly, it's crazy. The, my personal growth plan, with Greg Jackson was to not go to the ground at all. So I was following orders. That's very scary, but I have all my trust in my coaches. He said, I want your, I don't want your safety to be the wrestling. I want you to stay on your feet. And I did, I used the wrestling when I had to because those were the orders, but I'm getting better. I don't like taking unnecessary damage, but it is, I, I won, I'm happy. You're back now in the featherweight division. You had that fight with Jeremy Kennedy that you lost based upon the shoulder separation. They had to stop the fight. Is that the fight that you want next? I have to just say one thing. The, the champion's going down to 135. Scott, it's time for me to fight for a world championship. I think Jeremy Kennedy and I fight for the vacant title. I hope the division doesn't get uh, held up. But let's fight for a world title. I'm ready. I'm not just going to be a good champion. I'm going to be a great champion. Give me that opportunity, please, Scott Coker. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. I would love to see that fantastic fight. Great job, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Aaron Pico. Another win, another impressive performance. Josh, you were with Aaron Pico at the very beginning, at the very start of this. You have seen his growth in maturity as well as his game. Yeah, he's matured so much as a fighter, not only just as a fighter, but you heard him in there. He understands, like, look, this, this guy wasn't a scrub. These are, the, these are difficult times you got to deal with somebody like that. On a week's notice, what he did tonight was spectacular. It's not easy to fight someone on short notice like that and have a performance like that. Congratulations to Aaron Pico. Josh, let me ask you this. You had a, a similar shoulder injury to Aaron Pico. Talk about your comeback from that in the glimpse of Aaron Pico, what he was going through to get back to this point. Well, there's just a process you have to go through. His mindset is he's a world-class athlete. You know, he was one match away from making the Olympic team in wrestling. I mean, he understands what it takes to, to be a world-class athlete. And he understands that what he did in the beginning of his career, the steps in the process he's gotten here, like now, he, he knew that I wasn't ready then. I'm ready now. Congratulations to Aaron Pico telling Mr. Scott Coker, look, I want a shot at that title soon. Well, tonight we have the finale of the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix, but things do not stop here. Whoever wins tonight, perhaps an even tougher test ahead. And the lightweight World Grand Prix, that is heating up.
The Bellator schedule is loaded with world-class MMA action. On May 12th, Bellator returns to the City of Light when former world champion and top-ranked Gegard Mousasi fights number two Fabian Edwards in a middleweight clash. Plus, former champion Brett Primus draws France's own Mansour Barnaoui in a lightweight World Grand Prix quarterfinal matchup. The heat gets turned up even more Friday, June 16th from the Wintrust Arena in Chicago with two title clashes in one night. In the main event, light heavyweight world champion Vadim Nemkov defends his belt against the soldier of God, Yoel Romero. Plus, Bellator's pound-for-pound -pound best and featherweight kingpin Patricio Pitbull looks to make history by becoming the only man to capture a belt in three different weight classes as he takes on bantamweight world champion Sergio Pettis. Bellator MMA, where warriors rule. Speaking of warriors, it is time to get ready for our next fight. And look, we just saw a war in there. This next fight's going to be an all-out war. Hawaii Zone, Yancey Medeiros going up against Charlie Leary. Josh, both of these guys, they don't want to stop. They like to move forward. I was listening to your podcast with Big John. He said, I think it's going to be whoever flinches first. Talk to us about Yancey Medeiros, though. He loves to put on a show. You're gonna have, he's going to have the crowd on his side. What can we expect from him? Well, his first fight last year in Bellator, he got this crowd electric when he opened up the car. He's fantastic. He's someone that comes forward, will take a shot to give a shot. He, I have never seen him in a boring fight. He comes and he brings it. When he fought Amayo Sanchez, he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and just told him, hey, we're going to trade right here inside the cage. We're going to let give the fans what they want. But you have to remember, to, to have a great fight like that, you have to have a dance partner. And Amayo Sanchez is the perfect dance partner. And guess what? They lined him up again tonight with another perfect dance partner in Charlie Leary. He is fantastic fantastic with his jab, his combinations, and he brings the crowd into that cage with him and his home state of Hawaii. They're going to be electric tonight for him. That fight literally had dancing in it, a couple of steps there. Let's talk about Leary a little bit more. Big John called him a zombie. You called him the same thing, so I had you guys explain that to me. He said, look, he just wants to keep moving forward. He wants to keep moving forward. He will not stop. So I'm going to call it The Walking Dead. How do you stop The Walking Dead? I mean, you really just got to make sure you pace yourself when you're fighting him. Don't don't get overzealous with him. Hit him with the good shots. Understand that he will still be there in the second and third round with the big shots. Every big shot he takes, he'll take it, he'll walk through it, he'll deliver some more. He will find a way to be crafty inside that cage. You can hear the crowd going crazy right now for Yancy Medeiros. But Charlie Leary is a zombie. He will come in, take those shots, and deliver more. But he will still be there in the second and third round. Yancy Medeiros just walked out backstage. The crowd can see him, though. Sean, let's get ready for this fight. Uh, guys, the, the duality of this scenery and this spectacular setting with the fight history that is so much a part of it, it is really just an extraordinary once in a lifetime kind of once in the world kind of place another special week for bellator here on the annual trip it feels in so many ways that mma is part of the island's dna personified by one of its favorite sons coming home and now to make his way to the cage charlie 917 leary Well, we've all had a high score somewhere, depending on your age. It could have been in pinball or on Donkey Kong, or maybe you came of age in the time of Mortal Kombat or Minecraft, but every game has that one guy that's just better. Years ago, Charlie Leary and about 40 of his friends were at a bachelor party, and they had one of those punching machines that measures how hard you hit. He had the high score, 917, and that's how he got the nickname. It's pretty hard to make a career out of Donkey Kong or Minecraft, but John, being the dude that hits the hardest, that you could find a home for in this world. You might find a career doing something. I don't know what it would be, but now Charlie Leary, we've seen multiple times. That, like, he is a tough fighter, well-versed everywhere, a guy that comes forward. I don't know if that's the style that's the best to match up with Yancey Medeiros, because he comes forward. We're going to see which guy backs up first. That's what I was talking talking about with Amanda Guerra. We're going to see who flinches first. And now set to make his way. Yes, True love raining down on one of the favorite sons. It was 
Ten years ago, when he was getting ready to face the veteran Eves Edwards, he noticed a piece of paper, a bout sheet, if you will, had a bunch of stats on it next to his name. Nancy Madero, someone had written to kids. And it stuck. He liked it. Why? Because he says kids wake up happy every day. They're not born with hatred and negativity. And that's how he's lived his life. That's how so many on this spectacular, almost spiritual island live their lives. OPS, he's also pretty happy punching dudes in the face. <laughs> Just a little bit. I've worked with Yancey Madero's in the case. You're talking about a true fighter here. This guy will sit and scrap with anybody, but he is a true technician. He's not someone that just wants to get hit. He will throw down, but he will pick you apart with his skill set. He is the real deal. Check out the tail of the tape. Let's go to a contract wait. That is exactly what we have. We have a contract weight, and it's at 165 pounds, but Yancey Medeiros comes in way under that at 162.4 with Charlie Leary right at 164.2. To Michael C. Williams. Bellator MMA moves now to a contract weight fight at 165 pounds, set for three five-minute rounds live on Showtime. We introduce the blue corner. At six foot, weighing in 164.2 pounds, his professional record, 17 wins, 13 losses, one draw, from Watford, England, Charlie, 917 Leary. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 162.4 pounds. After an epic battle and victory in his Bellator debut, he's back now with a professional record, including 16 victories, eight defeats from Makaha, Hawaii. Is that Charge Frank Trigg. Goodbye. Speaking of veterans who've seen some things. Thank you. Nancy Maderos, his career at a high level has been so Ready? long. He's been Ready? around at the top Fight. level so long. He fought in strike force on the undercard of Fedor and Verdun in 2010. <laughs> the famous fight that ended the win streak. The legendary win streak of Fedor, which died in the guard. Of Fabrizio Verdun with the SAP Center. Yes, he did. Darryl Samuel Sanchez fight, you see the highlights of was just spectacular. Uh, the one thing that I really believe that Yes Medeiros has an advantage in when we're looking at both fighters, he's the faster fighter. He's got the faster hands. Charlie's got some power in his hands, but yes, he gets it there a little bit faster. So Charlie's got to think about throwing straight shots to try to equalize some of that speed. We don't think of an older fighter or a veteran fighter feeling certain kinds of external pressures, but for a Hawaiian fighter to fight in Hawaii when you know they want a show, hard to ignore that. Oh, yeah. It, 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 I always look at it. I think it's you know, actually so difficult for Hawaiian fighters to fight in front of their home people crowd because there is pressure there but they all just absolutely eat it up they love it they think it's the greatest thing ever they get to have their mom paul everybody their, all their aunties and everybody coming out so they're happy with it they deal with it well oh that was a good shot by charlie there that was an attention getter it was i did boxing with the great sergio mora the last snake and he talked about Latino fighters feeling that pressure, that uh, that machismo, right? That you got to put on that kind of show, yeah. particularly in Southern California. Same idea. Well, there's no doubt about it. The Hawaiian fighters are known for throwing down. They are known. That, hey, they will go out there and just scrap. But that's great, and it shows you got heart. But you got to be smart. And one of the things that we've seen out of Yancey throughout the years, he's been a very smart fighter. He knows when to attack. He's up against a guy that has power in Charlie Lewis. The per capita output of fighters in this state is extraordinary. So there's no doubt that Nancy has the better talk. 
That was never really going to be in doubt. That one didn't have to go to the judges. That's no. a 10-7. I mean, I'm, look, I'm looking at some of the marks already on on Charlie, and you're looking, you go, you don't see him on on Yancey. And it's not that he hasn't been hit. It's just Charlie's marking up just because he's just white. <laughs> I was I was born as an SPF 50 guy myself. So All I can't. Right, there you go. That's the difference between living in England and Hawaii. That's another clean right hand. Right. You don't see this got a nice little cut inside that right eye. That's, that looks like a bad spot. We'll get a closer look. You see Charlie being very smart. Again, throwing straight shots, using that jab. Round here for Larry. Yeah, he's not fast, but he's effective. That, that was a one big got right hand that got through. Nancy kind of biting down. Starting to throw back big shots. He's trying. Oh, there's one. Right. Takes Missed Larry it. down. The first left got through. The zombie trying to walk right through it. You can see Yancey is still. He's still hurt too. Both guys. This is what this fight promised to be. They're in big trouble. Frank Trey taking a close look. Larry getting back to his feet. How? Nancy Madero's throwing heavy shots. Both these guys oh. are going big shots. The spinning back press connected. Nancy Madero drags him to the ground. Because if I can't knock him out, maybe I can choke him out. Well, he could definitely get that because right now Charlie Leary's brain is just not working well. There and we're go. done. Spectacular. two warriors like that could truly understand absolutely take a look at some of these shots that was the one the answer to that big left hand that started and he capitalized on that right that put Charlie Leary down and that's when Charlie had already hurt Yancey and I said Yancey's biting down he's just starting to sling back Charlie you can see the eyes just not a whole lot's there he's not able to control his balance he goes down he's staring at the out in the distance because the brain just is not truly connected. Yancey was smart to go after the choke at this point. Gets behind him, sinks in the rear naked choke, and another big hometown win for Yancey Medeiros. You said Charlie Leary's mind wasn't working right, but Yancey's clearly was to make that decision. Absolutely. That is, you know, talk about fighting smart. You've been pounding on the guy, you can't get him out of there. Go to that submission. Moments that in so many ways this sport is all about, right there. A different kind of Hawaiian postcard to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it's the rear naked jump that finally brings it to an end. The tap at four minutes, 39 seconds in the round number one. The winner by submission, Yassi This will be a fun conversation. Yancey Medeiros, is there anything you want to say to this crowd? 
Hawaii, I love you! Oh man, Leif, this is what I am, man. If you ever look at Aloha, it's this right here. It's all this right here. Boy, I love you so much, bro. I'm a product of my environment, man. This is why I'm here, baby. The Hawaiian wave continues. You started that off, you were being a sharpshooter. He was actually using a good straight shot. He hurt you a couple of times. And you bit down on the mouthpiece and you said, oh yeah, okay, it's time to scrap. And you went after him. Yeah. You hurt him bad. Did you know that you could put him away with the shots? Or why did you go to the rear naked choke? I thought it was brilliant, White, when you did it. Um, one thing about Hawaii, bro, we love to bang, bro. And we, when, we spent, when we got the fire, we in it, cooking. And no disrespect to the English man, but couldn't come and come Hawaii, Hawaii again on the island and have his way. <laughs> so, you know, not, not today, not this year, but thank you, bro. Charlie, you're, you're a G, bro, a vet, and I appreciate everything. Thank you for the opportunity. Hawaii, I love you, Hawaii. Always. Aloha, always, always. We haven't seen you fight since last year here in Hawaii. Is this going to be what it is? You're only going to fight? On the islands, or what's gonna happen? Nah, last year I had a torn retina, so you know, my vision was compromised, I mean, my sight was compromised, but the vision is clear. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so, I mean, whenever, whenever it comes, I wanna um, thank you, Scott Coker, Mike Hogan, man. You guys make things so simple for me, but I really appreciate it, man. Bella Torre, you guys treat me well, man. I, I love you guys, thank you. Hawaii, get on your feet, give it up for your man. The winner, Yancy Madero. Guys, for two days, we've been talking about the fighting spirit of this extraordinary state. And I think we just, all of our words don't mean anything compared to what we just saw Yancy Madero show us. Absolutely, Sean. Uh, Josh and I have huge smiles on our faces. I think everybody in the building guys, just watching that, Josh, that is the type of fight you want to see. Two fighters who respect themselves. And you, you said it going into this. This was going to be an all-out war, and it was phenomenal. There's nothing like getting that type of win in front of all your family, your friends, people that you've known growing up your whole life. Man, it's a blessing. You he's, have he's, no word. I, he's, a, he's a lucky man. He's a very, very lucky <laughs> man. Love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, the crowd loves it as well. And he's, he's about to walk behind us there. This crowd has been on its feet the entire night, and especially for the Hawaiian fighters. It might even get even louder here in the next couple of minutes. The most well-known Hawaiian female fighter, Alima Lane McFarland, back in her home state tonight, taking on one of the toughest women in the flightweight division. Kana Watanabe taking a look at the rankings, though. They sit two and three. Last night, we saw Liz Carmouche defend her belt. You can very well make the argument, whoever wins tonight might be set up for a title shot. Josh, let's dive into the specifics of this fight. There is Alima Lane McFarland. Look, she's had a tough couple of years. Three years ago, she lost her belt. She was undefeated against Juliana Velasquez when she found that loss. She had to go through knee surgery. We are starting to see, though, the eliminator that we knew back then. Yeah, she went through the knee surgery, and through that process, there's a lot of instabilities in terms of the knee. So when she had fought, she came back against Bruno, uh, she came back against Justin Kish, didn't come, came up short. Then when she fought Bruna Ellen, she went back to the old ways of Alima Lay, using the hands, setting up the boxing, got to the top position, and found the ground and pound and delivered some big, big time shots. She had a great performance, got herself back on track, she's back to the eliminator. She seemed so focused. I saw her backstage as well. But look, she missed weight that last fight. She said, I will never, ever do that again. Sure enough, uh, she made it very easily this time. Let's talk about Kana Watanabe, though. Look, Alima Lay, very good on the ground, kind of very good on the ground as well she's also very good on her feet she's the three things you love to talk about tall long and lanky how does she try to upset alima lay here well we talked to her this week she said look this fight's gonna hit the ground we're gonna find out who the better who the better grappler is i'm gonna get her to the ground if she's gonna clinch with me i'm gonna hit toss her i'm gonna take i'm gonna throw her once she's on bottom i'm gonna do work and i'm gonna go ahead and start to attack and look she's a great submission practitioner she'll hit you with the throw she's okay with being on the bottom she's okay with being on the top but she'll work for that submission the whole time through against Denise Gilholtz, she was in the top position, pulled the head up, hit the triangle, rolled to her back, and got the finish. Nicely done by her. She's already made it very clear.
clear. This is going to be two of the best grapplers in the world figuring out who the best grappler in the world is tonight. And the crowd is, though, is going to be on the Lima Lay side. We have, we have earpieces in each year, and I can barely hear you when this crowd gets going because they are so amazing. Kano Watanabe looking to upset Alima Lay in her home state. She fights better here than anywhere else in the world, so can the Eliminator eliminate one of her biggest opponents yet? I'm a badass bitch. Let the luau begin! Alima Leigh McFarland would not be denied. Kano Watanabe. She is not worried about anything. This woman has been competing her entire life. Heavy hits, heavy pressure, heavy strikes. The triangle for Kano Watanabe. And now ready to make her way to the cage, Kana Watanabe! Evolution isn't a choice in this sport, it's a necessity, a sport that was born 30 years ago in essence to determine which discipline of fighting was superior. Kano Watanabe is a world-class judoka, so dominant she is in her base. She went undefeated for four years and 11 fights to start her career, but the knockout loss to Liz Carmouche forced her to evolve, and not only did she jump right back in, John, with an elite striker in Denise Kielholz, as you saw, she subbed her. Look, Kana Watanabe has got beautiful judo, and she is so good in the top position on the ground. I don't see other ladies getting away from her when she gets to that position. Very physically strong. If you're going to look at what she does, it matches up so well with Alima Lane. It's really going to be the question, does the judo of Watanabe outdo the jiu-jitsu of McFarland because in my opinion just like Josh talked about this fight is gonna hit the ground It took almost no time for Alima Lay McFarland's walkouts to become must-see, and it took even less time for her to realize that with that platform comes great responsibility. The age of shut up and dribble, shut up and fight, that's a relic in the time of social justice, especially when you have the opportunity to be a voice for the voiceless.
some very dark places in it. Native Hawaiian girls facing disproportionately higher rates of violence and sex trafficking. The song Alima specifically chose was to honor Monono, Hawaii's most famous ancient female warrior. Alima Lejon is Hawaii's most famous modern day female warrior and her legacy, especially here in her home state, that is secure. But here's the question I'm gonna ask you. Does she truly want one more run at the top? You're asking me, does she truly want it? Yeah, she truly wants one more run at the top, and that's why she's here tonight going against Kana Watanabe. The question is, when you become the champion and you have all of these other things that happen, is your focus that laser focus 100% on fighting, or are you putting some of that focus in places that it's actually deterring from you stepping in that cage? She says she's no longer defined by her success in the cage. Her loss here in Hawaii last time, she realized that was her biggest fear in the world, was losing a fight here. And then her world didn't collapse when she actually lost a fight here. But now, the specter of a world title opportunity, the specter of a meeting with her longtime friend, Liz Carmouche, has driven her to this spot. But believe us when we tell you, Kana Watanabe is no one to look past. Our tail of the tape for this flyweight matchup. Look, Alima Lane McFarland, the former champion at 12 and 2. Kana Watanabe, 11, 1 and 1. This is as good as it gets in the flyweight division, looking for who is going to possibly be the champion's next challenger. Live on Showtime from the Blaisdell here on the island of Oahu. Bellator Hawaii now presents the co-main event of the evening. Three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing first the blue corner. At five foot six, weighing in 125.6 pounds, ranked now at number two as a professional. She's near perfect at 11 and one with one draw. Fighting out of Tokyo, Japan, the judo beauty piece, Kanda Watanabe. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner. And five foot four, weighing in 126 pounds even, the former flyweight world champion is back on her island with the number three ranking. She stands at 12 professional victories, two defeats. Ladies and gentlemen, proudly hailing from the Luanu Valley Kingdom of Hawaii, presenting And the referee in charge, Kerry Hatley. All right, ladies, this is where you work for. Ready? Let's go to work. High emotion, high stakes. Tanabe's only loss, almost a flash knockout in a minute to Liz Carmouche. The signature win on Liz Carmouche's climb towards the flyweight world title, which she successfully defended here last night. Inevitable, John, this gets to the ground. It's just a matter of how. It is. It's only a question of time. Both ladies are going to be on the feet, trying to strike with good strikes, but eventually the clinch is going to come. And when it does, you're going to see each of these ladies looking to be the person that comes out in the top position. So I don't see how it ends up being on the feet for very long. It's straight right from the Lima Lima McFarland. Nice move, I kind of want that. Three years and five title defenses for Lima Lima for a division that didn't even exist when she started in her second fight. As a professional, was her Bellator debut in 2015. 
year later, she was the champion. Nice right hand by Olivia McFarland. Much more confident with her stand up now than you talk about in the past, like you're talking about. She relied mostly on that grappler, but she's always had power in her hands. And now we're seeing the fight get to that point. Tana Watt now be working hard to get this to the ground, be in the top position. And Watsunami, when she gets into the ground, doesn't really hunt for submissions. She just dominates from that position. They both high-level grapplers, but very different. Yeah, Watsunami will rely on ground to pound a lot. She likes to work with strikes on the ground, get to a half guard. She likes to do a lot of damage from that. Emily McFarlane more of that Eddie Bravo 10th planet. She also has that strong wrestling background. Well, she was a wrestler here in Hawaii. She's got that, but a slick move by Kana Watanabe. Look out for the arm. And Emily can she grab the wrist to keep herself safe. That was close. That was a dangerous moment. From Watanabe. Ali Malay, in a lot of her earlier wins, her title offenses, she was a stronger fighter. She was able to impose her will on the ground. Yeah, one of the things that we know about Watanabe is her physical strength. We've seen her multiple times just physically out muscle her opponents. Nice job to get out. in the right five zone. And Alina needs to just continue to look towards, hey, I need to throw my hands. Just like that. Step in, throw your hands, throw in combinations, and then exit out, readjust, come back and do it again. In her entire career, and you see now the damage that Alina Lynn McFarland is starting to inflict, and other right gets through. Her entire career has been using these strikes to set up the groundwork, yep. and in this case, it might not be such a bad thing for her to keep it here. Why not? She felt, you know, what Tana's like, that that right hand has found a home. She's winning this round big because of it. From be the beginning of this round, she's been accurate with that right hand. She needs to believe in it. World championship-level fighters find different ways to win. What the situation calls for. Things about Watanabe, take a look. That head's right on the center line, doesn't move it much. So it's a target. And she left it on the center line against Liz Carmouche. The fight didn't last very long. Exactly. Great work by Lena McFarland. Not settling to be on the bottom. She needs to be careful of her neck right now, but she's in still. She's in position to shake herself out. Only six Dominic. seconds left. Big round on the feet for Alimale McFarlane. Okay, if she, she stays safe, she can to the end of the round. That's high-level stuff right here. Alimale really found a home for that right hand throughout the first round and it was a difference maker in this round she did some damage with that there was grappling back and forth and I'll say that one army got a little bit better at the grappling as far as positions but never was able to put on any type of ground and pound or submission the right hand by Alina Lemon Farley we know she's got power with it and it keeps finding a home <laughs> See where that cut is on the bridge of the nose on the inside. What an effective vision. Oh, 
Both fighters, particularly Liam and Lee McFarland, so many five round fights. And that changes the dynamic, too, when you're suddenly in a three round fight. All right, here we go, ladies. Round two. Ready? Let's go to work. I think Watanabe is going to want this on the ground sooner. And you're seeing Watanabe really start to push here. Looking towards getting that takedown, trying to set it up with her hands. She's, she's feigning that takedown, looking for level changes. There she goes. That's good stuff from Melinda Lam McFarland against world class judoka. What you really that backside and all these little sweet techniques with the legs and feet very very difficult to deal with but right now Lima doing a good job against Kana Watanabe's ju judo technique again there's that sweeping of that foot very nicely done by Kana Watanabe And I think what, you know, really what we're seeing out of Helena is she, by looking at tape of Kana Watanabe, she's saying, look, she doesn't really go after a lot of submissions on the ground. She's more of that ground and pound style. She uses her strength. She hits people with strikes. I'm not going to sit there for her. I'll give my back to try to get myself back to my feet. And it's worked for her so far. Here we have Alimale is the one looking for that. She's starting to hunt now. Yeah, she's hunting for that. She's got that Kamara grip on the arm, but it's going to be very difficult in this position for her to clear that arm. It's all the way across the body. Not in a bad position at all for Kana Watanabe. Hard to tell how tight that is. Well, it, it is a scissor, and it can put her out if she gets it on both sides of the neck. If you can touch those carotid arteries, I'm not sure that she's in that position to make that happen. Normally, that's when your calves are on the neck. And Ray McFarland trying to connect her hands for a second now. Donna's in a nice position as far as side control, but she's put her hands and locked her hands. So right now she's nothing more than pressure. Now she's released that. We're going to see what she tries to do. At least both hands. Again, exactly the scouting report here. She hasn't done much with the position. Yet. She's looking towards that arm triangle. She's trying to separate that arm. You see her ahead keeping that. Yes, nice job by eliminating the far exploding out, getting back to her feet. But she cannot get out of the grasp of Kana Watanabe. Don't grab it. Very few do. On the outside trip. from the bottom and she has stayed more on offense in this discussion of position versus damage like that in what is a close round but the, the heavier shots are going to be from Kana Watanabe she has the ability to throw with the gravity and moving her arm back you can only move your arms back so far to load up if you're Lima Lane McFarland coming up there's just not as much velocity or torque on it. More elbows from the bottom. 
Tanafi strikes more effective, but more volume from Alina Lynn McFarland from the bottom. This is going to be a tough round. You knew we were going three here. I had a feeling this fight was gonna last a while. Both ladies working really hard. And our final piece of business is the final piece of the Bantamweight World Grand Prix. One of the most anticipated fights in the sport this year. Closing in on a dramatic conclusion to a Grand Prix that has exceeded even the outrageous expectations we had for it at the start. Expectations for this fight were pretty high. The stakes are very high. And we are likely, likely going to the third round here, I would think, John 1-1. That's the way I have it right now. I've got this 1919. Both ladies winning around. All comes down to the third round. All right, ladies, great job. Last round, ready? Let's go to work. Emily's <laughs> really gonna have to work at using her strikes to keep the pressure of Kana Watanabe. She wasn't able to do that right here at the beginning. Watanabe already forcing her towards the cage. Now oh, Lina Lay holding on, didn't That's give in to that takedown. Watanabe looking to Uchimata there. Gets Alimale down, but she doesn't have her where she wants her right now. Alimale goes, look towards the reversal, wasn't able to slide through. Alimale could finish this off by folding that leg over. Yeah, yeah, a couple of good shots got in, and it may not seem like much, but the margins here feel very thin. They are very thin. You're seeing both ladies having their moments, both having the ability to possibly get the advantage on their part. Beautifully done by taking the hand away by Kana Watanabe. Not giving Alima a lot of room to work here. Watanabe really wants to turn Alimale off of that fence, get those feet away, and Lima keep as much as she can and explode when she decides to go. You can really use that fence to wall walk, turn your body position, it makes it very difficult for your opponent to hold you. Watanabe really had Alimale McFarlane's left arm pinned, and Alimale McFarlane working hard to free that left arm, which he just did. That's why she couldn't explode out the first time. I really like to see Alima Lake wall walk herself to the left here. Still right. Well, now be able to get towards the back. Alima's going to get to her feet. Nice work. Watanabe's still holding on, though. We've seen this multiple times throughout the fight. Alimale works her way back to her feet, but Watanabe does not let go. I was just thinking there, is there an elbow here for Alimale McFarland? That looked like it was there. She doesn't want to let go of the wrist. At some point, someone's going to have to take some chances here as we go into the final two minutes of an extremely close fight. Yeah, this fight is still definitely up for grabs. Every little shot matters. It does. And 
Lee Millen McFarland won the first round and felt on the feet. Connor Watanabe won the second round, dominating from top position on the ground. Here's where, here's where Lee Millen really yes, needs to look over his hands. Believe in your power. Believe in that right hand. It's been landing throughout the fight in the first round. When you're on your feet, you were great with it. It feels like Kata Watanabe has to get this to the ground here within the final minute. Yeah, you would think this is a very important part right now. If she gets the takedown, it's going to be tough for Limele. If she doesn't, Limele just these little strikes. This feels like sudden death overtime right now. That's how close this fight is. Job Alina Lenny Carlin has done to stay on her feet here. Against one of the best in the world at making you not. Great stuff from two of the best in the world. Stop, stop, stop. Twenty-four hours ago, Liz Carmouche had come from behind. Successful title defense with a fourth-round submission of Deanna Bennett. Her eyes peeled on this. Her longtime connection to Japan, where she grew up. She has a dream of fighting Kana Watanabe in Japan. Her longtime friend, Alima Lebek Farland, and the longtime dream of those two fighting for the world title. in the hands of the judges to determine which direction this division that has given us so much goes next. Let's take, take a look at some of this action. Alimele here when she was going for the takedown. You see the wizard by Kana Watanabe. She's working herself back to her feet. And then Watanabe uses that wizard, pulls the hand here, beautifully done. But really wasn't able to do much with the position. The difference, uh, John, the difference to me, it seems, is that Alima Le was doing some damage while Watanabe was hunting for position that she never really got in that third round. It, I mean, it's super close. It is that, close, but it's that, that right hand is the real difference maker in it because it landed and it had some impact. Not a whole lot else did. Here we go, ladies. Right here, right here. High drama. We're about to find out what Michael C. Williams already knows. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in tonight's co main event, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Derek Cleary, scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees it for Watanabe. Your second judge at cage side, Sal DeMotto, scores at 29 to 28, scoring the fight for McFarland. Your third and final judge at cage side, Brian Miner, 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision. said it would be decided by a hair. It went down to the wire. But the defense to offense in the third round for Alime Lay McFarland was the difference, and she once again is with John McCarthy. I am here with the Pineapple Princess, Alime Lay McFarland. That was a tough back and forth battle. How are you feeling right now? Man, I, that was nerve wracking. Um, all respect to Kana, she is 
amazing on the ground, amazing grappler. Um, I always thought my grappling was good, man, but she is top tier grappler. So mahalo, arigato, Kana and her team. Um, thank you. Your right hand, I thought was the difference maker in the fight. I thought your right hand landed with power and it landed effectively, it did the damage. The grappling was close both ways. She got the better in the takedowns, but you kept getting back to your feet. How confident were you going into this that you won this fight? Again, um, it really could have gone either way. I have to rewatch it. I think in the end, I probably was doing more damage. Yes, she took me down several times, but didn't really do any damage, and I was still throwing up elbows. And um, yeah, I mean, I just kept hearing my corner. The right hand's open, throw the right hand. Everybody's like, throw those Hawaiian hammers. Um, I want to shout out my corner. Boogeyman, Richie Martinez, Bill Crawford, PJ Barch. We're missing Manolo Hernandez. Um, but those guys, man, they are the best corners in the world. And um, they got me through this fight. Thank you, guys. You are the inaugural flyweight champion here in Bellator. You lost that belt. One of your ex-training partners has that belt. Should that be the fight that they give you next? Do you deserve a shot at the flyweight title again? You know, Kana and I were ranked number two and number three, I believe. It only makes sense that the winner of tonight's fight got the winner of last night's fight, and that is my sister wife, Liz. There she is. Um, that's my girl. I have a lot of love for her. And we knew this day was coming. It was gonna come eventually. And uh, again, I'm not sure if this is like the official title contender fight, but I say it is. And I would love for my last fight to be against Liz right over there. Um, hopefully here in Hawaii. I don't have a choice but to retire in Hawaii. I don't want to wait another year, though. I want to come back in December. I don't think Liz wants to wait a year either. She always wants to fight. So let's get it done. Let's come back to Hawaii. Again, unofficially, but that's my choice right there. Sounds good to me. Congratulations on a big win. You fought fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, get on your feet. Give it up for your pineapple princess, Olima Lee McFarland. Alima has spoken, Hawaii has spoken, the people have spoken. Guys, I think it's pretty clear what everybody wants next. We've been waiting years. It seems inevitable. It really does, Sean. And look, there's a lot of things that we need to unpack with what Alima Lane McFarland just said. But Josh, first, we're going to go back to this fight. We're going to talk about the future here in a second. Uh, this was razor thin. You went cage side to watch it. You came up here. You thought the fight went to Kana. Instead, it goes to Alima Lane. Yeah, John, Big John and I talk about this all the time on our podcast. And when we discuss the judges' decisions, I thought that Kana did enough to get it done. But look, I no way am I going to say this to robbery. That turn gets thrown around. And the judges did a great job. It was a very razor thin close fight. So if it went to Ali Malay, no one's mad. Obviously Hawaiians are not mad, <laughs> but nobody's mad. It was it was a great fight, a very technical fight by two of the best in the world. We have been wondering when Ali Malay McFarland would retire. There was there was talk even potentially after tonight. Would she retire? She said she wants her last fight to be against her friend, Liz Carmouche, the current champion there. And, and you see them hugging there. They're, they're very good friends. They both live in the San Diego area. Uh, I believe Ali Malay borrowed Liz Carmouche's truck the other day. What would you think about that fight and how fitting it would be? Well, I've talked to Ali Malay over the last couple of years. And they've actually split from being training partners a couple of years back because they understood they probably were going to meet for the title here shortly. You know, it took a little detour when Ali Malay lost the title. They were expecting to meet sooner. But Liz did her job. Now Ali Malay did hers. What we saw tonight from Ali Malay was spectacular. She came right through the knee injury, a little rusty, figured it out her last fight, and now tonight, Great performance, a very tough, tough performance, gritty performance. She needed that tonight. Now we're going to potentially see the her try to get her title back. As she said, nothing is official right now. We'll see what the schedule unfolds. We want to talk about our schedule, though. Look, we have the, the Bantamweight World Grand Prix finale tonight. Mark 
this on your calendar, folks. Friday, June 16th in Chicago, or heck, come on out and see us. We'll be there. We're excited about the main event. I want to highlight, though, the co-main event, Sergio Pettis, going up against Patricio Pipple there. Sergio Pettis is the current Bantamweight champ. He got injured, had to step away. Patricio Pipple looking to make history, going into net another division to try to win a belt. Talk to us about this. <laughs> Don't sigh. You gotta talk about it, man. I can't say enough about what Patricio's trying to do. He is he's the pillar of Bellator. He's he's been the 155-pound champ when he knocked, knocked out Michael Chandler. He's the 145-pound champ for the longest reigning time. Now he's going down to 135 to do something that no one has ever done. And he's doing it against Sergio Pettis, who is dynamic, explosive. He's coming off of a knee injury, but I'm gonna see this fight happen. I'm telling you, stylistically, it's a great matchup. You have a power striker versus a technical striker, but Patricio's got wrestling, he's got all the experience. I can't go against the dog, man. He's my guy, man, Patricio Pitbull. It, it's really hard to say, though, because Sergio Pettis, look, before he got hurt, he was supposed to fight the guy we're about to see fight, Rafian Stotts. They are friends. They did not want to go up against one another in this Grand Prix, but if for some reason Rafian wins tonight, he could be very well going up against Sergio. Obviously, you think Patricio may have the upper hand there. So I don't like to really put all that stuff aside. I mean, I'll put all that stuff aside because, look, there's a lot that needs to happen for, for Patricio and, and uh, Pettis. And then also tonight, we got to see how it all shakes out. All right, and we didn't know who was going to be in the finale tonight. We couldn't ask for a better one, though. It is time for the finale of the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix. Rafian Stotts going up against Patchy Mix. Let's take a look at how we got here. Rafian winning, winning, excuse me, that interim belt in his first fight against Juan Archuleta, then beating his biggest enemy in MMA in Danny Sabatello. Patchy Mix, on the other hand, the unanimous decision win against Kyoji Horiguchi, submitting Magomed Magomedov. Both Stotts and Mix only have one loss in their careers, but that will end tonight. One million dollars on the line. There is Rafian Sats. Josh, let's talk about him. In his first two fights, he won. He struggled in part of them. When he was going up against Danny Sabatelli, he said, I was probably a little too confident. I didn't do enough work. He really didn't bring anyone to help him. He said, I learned my lesson. I will not make that mistake against catching well, Mix. He kicked off this tournament by winning the interim world title. He's carried it all the way through. When he fought Juan Archuleta, it was beautiful. He was having some problems with him, though, early with the body shots, the footwork of Juan Archuleta. He figured it out, let the hands go through the head kick. But when he hit the Sabatello fight, he's like, oh, I'm a two-time national champion for Division II. I can out-wrestle him. He didn't realize how fast Danny Sabatello was. He didn't realize how grimy Danny Sabatello was. It wasn't just all talk from Danny Sabatello. Rafael Stotts figured that out. He understood and made the adjustments. And now we're here. He said, look, I'm ready for Patchy Mix. You use the word grimy, and I think that's a great word actually to describe Patchy Mix because he is so good across the board, and he has looked so dominant in this tournament. He has the nickname, the human backpack, because once he gets on your back, it's really hard to get him off. Where does he have the advantage against a guy like Rafael? On the ground. Absolutely on the ground. It's also his body style, as I like to say, tall, long, and lanky. He's gonna, he's gonna use, utilize his jab. He's gonna stick that jab, and when he sticks that jab in your face, it, it makes it easier for him to close the distance, get to your back, and look to get the finish. Now, when he fought Horiguchi, he was able to get there several times, because when he gets to the neck or when he gets to the back, he's normally a finisher. But he learned a lot in terms of not chasing the submission too much, keeping the top position. But then when he fought Magomed Magomedov, when he shot that, that double leg Magomedov did, he was able to hit the neck, Locked it up nice and tightly and put him to sleep. And on the feet, though, he's he's taller than Rafian Stotts. He has a longer reach there, a longer length. Josh, let me ask you this. Your first fight, how much money did you make? Let's not talk about it. No, seriously, I seriously, paid, though. I paid $25 to fight my first fight. And I happen to know your second fight. It I made was $150. $150. Yep. A million dollars on the line. This is also livelihood. How big of a deal is it? to these guys. Yes, they want the belt, but I mean, this money is significant. I'm so mad that we're talking about this much. <laughs> this is amazing yeah, right. for them. No, <laughs> it really comes down to there's so much at stake for both of these fighters. It's not only just the interim title that they're winning at the Bantamweight Tournament. They're winning the World Grand Prix belt also, plus the million dollars and the potential to fight potentially Pettis or Patricio to unify the belts. I'll give you. There's a lot here tonight. You can feel the tension inside the room. I felt the tension all week from them. I, I, I made a bet with Big John earlier and I won $20, so I'll give that to you. Look, we've done all the talking. It's time to find out whose life hey is about to change. Growing up in Houston, Texas, memories are, are just filled with, you know, a lot of fun and family. 
My mom is the most influential figure in my life. She was a single parent. She came up in Section 8 housing. She scratched and clawed her way out. She always taught us how to be sensitive, how to be tough. She taught us everything. My mom passed away. That was a super heavy blow to me. I went through this state of just being angry at everything, angry at the world, angry at God. Wrestling for me was a positive outlet because I can use that anger and put that anger into something. Well, it was anger at first, and then it turned into me doing this to like make my mama proud. That, you know, kind of spiraled off to me like winning major championships in wrestling and to where we are today. It was great going up in Angola, New York. Um... It's a small suburb outside of Buffalo. When I was born, my uh, cousin Rose adopted me, and um, I weighed one pound eight ounces. I was very premature. Didn't know if I would make it. When Rose brought me home, she said she could like fit me in her palm. It was very hard growing up. All my friends had mom and dad. I always had mom, and mom was Rose, and Rose was our cousin. It's just a different family dynamic that I always had to explain. The suburb where I'm from, it's a tough story to tell all the other kids that are around the school. Me being the youngest, I think, made me tough, and me seeing that my brothers and sisters, 16 years old, they were working. I was the one to chase my dream. I didn't play football, I didn't play baseball, I didn't play basketball. You know, wrestling was my life. I like the single combat of wrestling. I like the one versus one, a man versus man. And I knew at a young age that I wanted to compete in MMA or at a higher level. My senior quote was, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Six minutes on the mat is all that matters. Six minutes was all we had, you know? You only had that time to make your name. And right now, 25 minutes and uh, one man standing in my way of a world title, a million dollars, and everything I've ever dreamed of. I remember times where I had to like win a jiu-jitsu tournament to make rent. For me, this a million dollars is life-changing money. When I get this win, my life will change, my family's life will change, and um, I'm just gonna take care of my family. Oh, and there's good timing by Magomedov. What a reversal by Mix. The Apache Mix Express continues rolling in the Bantamweight World Grand Prix. I feel like I've overcome a lot of obstacles to get to this point, and this is one last big hurdle. And still, Anton Valentin, World Champion, Rafian Stiles. Rafian Stiles versus Patchy Mix, the two best bantamweights in the world. We are going to have a contest of all the skills of MMA. Fighting for a chance to change everybody in their family's life. Kickboxing, karate, wrestling, jujitsu, all the skills put together. Two dudes, you know, ready to, to throw bombs. I will dominate him in every moment of the fight, in every position of the fight. The human backpack. I'm well equipped to defend and offend. It's over! Rufian Superstar! You know I'm better than six of them. I got one more. It's gonna be Rufian Stas. We have the best of the best who's ready to compete for a million dollars. I feel like it don't get much bigger than that. They love to win, they're driven by it, but the great ones, they hate losing far more than they love winning, and that is the motivator. Three years ago, then 26-year-old Patchy Mix was undefeated, challenging for the world title. It was a little too much, a little too soon. But look at the big picture. Bellator debut at Madison Square Garden, fought at Saitama in Tokyo, beat James Gallagher in Dublin, took out tournament favorite Keoji Horiguchi, choked out the 19-2 Magomed Magomedov. Every step upwards has been a step forward, all leading to this moment tonight. John, how does he cross the finish line first? 
He crosses the finish line by doing exactly what got him here. Use your skill set. You've got good hands. Rely on your hands to get to the takedowns. And when you get the takedowns, get to the back and look for that submission. Look to do damage on the ground. But his submission game is just outstanding. Patchy Mix, patience will be a virtue in this. Do not press. Be patient. And when you can, hit those transitions from the stand-up to the ground. Transitions are the key. A career that's led him here under all of these lights. And now, the defending interim Bantamway World Champion, Rafian Super. sure where you were on April 4th, but in Houston, Texas, it was Rafion Stotts Day. You may not have noticed, and why should you? Because it feels like every day has been Rafion Stotts Day the last six years. 11 straight wins, a meteoric rise to the top of one of MMA's deepest divisions. And how's this for Full Circle? His Bellator debut here in this building. His KO of Juan Archuleta to claim that interim title in the tournament opener here in this building. And tonight, here in this building, a chance to become a Grand Prix champion and a whole lot richer. John, how does he do it? Sounds like you're trying to say there's something about this building and Rafael Stotts. <laughs> Look, he gets it done by being the good wrestler that he is, but using it to be the guy that stays on the feet. He's got fast hands. He's got faster hands than Patchy. He's got good power. You just don't want to go into where your opponent's strengths are. Frustrate mix with your stand-up, and if you end up on the ground, never turn your back. We've waited a year, the tail of the tape in the main event in the Grand Prix final. As simple as it gets, you got two of the finest Bantamweight fighters in the world facing off right here for the Bantamweight World Grand Prix. 19 and one for Rafion Stotts. Right behind that at 17 and one is Patchy Mix. Main event time, Bantamweight World Grand Prix final time, Michael C. Williams time. Bellator MMA live on Showtime from Honolulu, Hawaii. The time has come to conclude the $1 million Bantamweight World Grand Prix tonight. In the main event, five five-minute rounds for the interim Bellator Bantamweight World Championship. Sanctioned by the Hawaii State Athletic Commission Executive Officer James Skizuski. And now, first introducing the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 135 pounds with an impressive submission victory in the semifinal round. The former world title challenger enters with 17 professional victories against a single defeat. Holding the number two ranking, he's fighting out of Buffalo by way of Angola, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenger, Patchy Noya. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 134.2 pounds, coming off a hard fought split decision victory in the semifinals. He'll make his second title defense tonight, entering with 19 professional victories, just one defeat out of Houston, Texas. He is the defending interim Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Ruffian Super. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge, Jason Herzog. Okay, fighters, win over the rules in the back. There were no final questions from you. There were no final questions from you. If you want to touch gloves, do it now. Come out ready to fight. Jason Herzog has never refereed Rafael Stats before. He's refereed Patchy Mix once, and it was the only fight he ever lost. Thank you. That is what is on the line. The Grand Prix title, the interim Bantamweight World title. Both to the winner. A goosebump moment. That first strike you saw from Rafael Stotts going after that low calf kick, that 
very important to him in this fight. He needs to attack that lead leg Apache Mix. It's always so jarring when you see just how big Apache Mix is compared to everybody else in the division, everybody else in his weight class. He was just a monster at that size. Yeah, his length is just amazing when you're looking at a bantamweight fighter. Very long, and he uses it so well when he hits the ground. The only Bellator comparison I can make is Douglas Lima at welterweight. Yeah, that's a good comparison because Douglas is very tall for welterweight and stuff. You'll see certain guys that get, they're tall, but they don't fight tall. Patchy, even in the stand-up, he'll fight tall. But it's the way he uses his length with the grappling scenarios that makes him special. <laughs> might be the best bantamweight in the world. That someday may be right now. Oh my God, did he land a huge shot on Rafion Stotts. Rafion was stiff going down. He was out. That is not the way most people look at Patchy Mix winning fights, but man, did he just show the power that he could possess. Let's take a look at what happens here. Jab with the right hand by Apache Mix. Watch the knee right there on the button. He was out. That's what hits him. Big time. The very knee. definition of a million dollar knee. My God, that was perfectly placed. Let's take a look at this real speed, and you'll see how fast it is. It's why I actually thought it was his left hand. No, it's the knee. Big time shot. I don't care who you are. You can hit by a knee like that, whatever size or weight you are. It lands with that impact on that spot, you are going out. Patchy Mix is the million dollar man. And the new interim bantamweight champion of the world. For every second of discussion about this fight that every talking head had on every show, on every podcast, it was all about could Patchy Mix get this fight to the ground and submit Rafion Stutz? Nobody saw a flying knee coming. The last one who didn't see it coming was Rafion Stutz. To Michael C. Williams for the official word. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially one minute, 20 seconds into round number one by knockout. He is now the one million dollar winner of the World Grand Prix and the new interim Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Patchy Nona The moments after the life changing moment. And it feels like it's just getting started for Patchy Mix. As impressive a run to a Grand Prix championship as we have seen, he's with John McCarthy.
I am here with the Million Dollar Man, Patchy Mix. That was an explosive, dynamic end to this Bantamweight World Grand Prix. How are you feeling, baby? Uh, I feel great, man. My mom, my brother, my family, my friends, everyone here, man. Um, Tatiana, Dr. Sean, fucking everybody came here for me. Um, everyone from, from the beginning, you know, 900 and some days ago, I fought Juan Archuleta for this title. I got so tired trying to finish him so early. This time, you know, people think I'm just a ground guy. I just knocked out 19-1 Rufian Stotts in a minute. You know what I mean? With my backside knee. I've been working that for months, you know? I, I knew he dips, and I knew I could catch him, you know? I knew I could catch him. I earned these belts, I earned a million dollars, I earned my black belt tonight. So let's get it, let's go. You went and put on an amazing performance in every one of your fights in this Grand Prix. You dominated a superior fighter in Kyoji Horiguchi, a guy who's done it all, been it all, been a champion. You dominated him. You took out Magomed Magomedov and submitted him, and now you just knocked out Rafian Stotts. You are the interim champion. You are the Bantamweight World Grand Prix champion, and there's gonna be a championship fight going on in Chicago in June with Patricio Pitbull Ferrer against Sergio Pettis. Which guy do you want to face for that title? I'll be there. You know, I'll sit there cage side. I'll be there to watch. It don't matter. You know, it's number one versus number seven, pound for pound. So whoever comes out on top will be on top. So, you know, all I got to say is, yes, sir, let's go, baby. I got both these belts. Let me get it. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for No Love, Patchy Mix. Guys, I think when we look back at this historically, we're gonna realize it's not just what Patchy Mix did, it is how he did it. You could not have scripted a more impressive start to finish dominant Grand Prix championship run. John, absolutely there. Josh, I, I'm gonna send it right over to you. What do you think about what we just witnessed there? One minute and 20 seconds in. Well, he was here last night, and I sat and told him, he's like, look, I'm the best Bantamweight in the world. There's no doubt about it. I, I train with guys all around the world, other organizations, I, I smoke all of them. And I, it's hard to argue right now. I mean, he's made short work of Rafael Stotts. He made short work of Magomed Magomedov, and he, he had a great dominant, dominant performance over Horiguchi. He walked his way through this tournament in impressive fashion. It's hard to argue that he's not the best man in the world. Absolutely. Look, he's going to take on the winner of whoever we see in Chicago between Sergio Pettis and, and Patricio Pitbull, though. Here it is. Walk us through the knee, though. Give, it, give us your play-by-play. -play. Look, my play-by-play -play is this. His body style, that tall, long, and lanky, I'm being honest, it works perfectly for MMA because of the wrestling backgrounds for a lot of these fighters. If you're tall, long, and lanky, you dip your head a little bit because of the wrestling or you dip your head a little bit for the striking to avoid being taken down. You usually dip right into a knee if you have that type of body style. He has made the changes since the Juan Archuleta fight. It's spectacular. He's learned how to be patient. He's learned how to be calm. He's learned He's learned that he is the best fighter in the world once he fixed that little tweak of don't chase it so much. It will develop in front of you. It's developed right in front of him. And now he's now he's the Bantamweight World Interim Champion. Now he's also the Bantamweight World Grand Prix Champion and a million dollars richer. Going up against Sergio or Patricio, I mean, he has a chance to take down either one of those guys. What do you think about one of those We We talked with him this week. You know what he said? Tell me. He, he wants Patricio. Of course he does. Who, who wouldn't want to fight Patricio? You want you want that guy. That guy is the pillar of the organization. So I got to ride with the old dog, man, Patricio. So when I'm looking at the two of them, that makes for a fantastic, fantastic fight. I'll tell you what, all my belief right now is in Patchy Mix. He sat there in the fighter meetings, and he did tell us. I went back in my notes to check. He said, I've been working on some stuff you guys haven't seen yet, and I'm going to show you. We asked him what it was. He wasn't going to tell us. Maybe that was it, though. Congratulations to Patchy Mix on winning the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix in $1 million. The sun is setting here in beautiful Hawaii on the island of Oahu, and the sun is setting on Bellator 295. As we wrap up two nights of MMA Live...
The explosive night here at Bellator 295 as we end back-to-back -back nights in Hawaii. Patchy Mix signing autographs, giving fist bumps there. He will say hi, I'm pretty sure, to anybody who wants to congratulate him because that man now has two belts. He won the Grand Prix, $1 million. He is our interim champ. The night we had the return of Aaron Pico to the cage after soldier, sh or soldier surgery, going up against James Gonzalez, who'd never been finished. He became just the second fighter to go the distance against Aaron Pico, but Aaron Pico winning that. A war was waged between Hawaii's own Yancey Medeiros going up against Charlie Leary. So much respect between these two. Neither was going down with the damage, though. Eventually, Medeiros with a submission. The crowd wasn't about to sit for the next one as fellow Hawaiian number two ranked flyweight Alima Lane McFarlane returned to the cage in her home state, but across from her, number two ranked Kana Watanabe. It was razor thin, but the eliminator winning this one and getting her hand raised at the very end. And at the very end of the night, it was the fight to end all fights. The final, the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix, $1 million on the line. Patchy Mix versus the interim champ, Rafion Stotts. It was over before Rafion Stotts knew it. One minute, 20 seconds in. Patchy Mix with a knee on the mark. Sean Grandy coined it. A million dollar knee.